Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyin muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and we pray all of us, we pray that Allah may build houses in Jannah for the group of young men and young women here in Cape Town who work so hard to make possible the second international Islamic retreat here in Simon's Town in South Africa. Amen. <laughs> and we pray for peace and blessings on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our topic is entitled Dimensions of Space and Time. Why such a heavy subject? Of what connection does it have with our retreat in which we have come together for the purpose of turning to the Quran and turning to Nabi Muhammad wasalam, to be able to understand the strange and mysterious world in which we live today which is growing stranger and more mysterious day by day. To understand it, to explain to it, and to respond to it appropriately. And in addition to that, to anticipate tomorrow. When we were students at the Alimi Institute of Islamic Studies, Karachi, Pakistan, Mawlana Muhammad Ali Khan is here, he will tell you. Uh, Sheikh Ali Mustafa is here, he will tell you. Our teacher, Mawlana Dr. Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, spent a lot of time talking about time and we couldn't understand why. I don't know about them, but I couldn't understand why is this man spending so much time on time? Are they too green? He used to talk about something called serial time and about something called biological time and about something called cosmic time and about something called absolute times, terms which are foreign to terminology to which we are accustomed with the Darul Loom. <laughs> So it is he who should be delivering this lecture today. Not this student, it will go in through one ears and coming out to the other ears. It was only when I went to Suratul Kaf as a proper student, many, many, many years later, oh my gosh, now I am beginning to understand what the Molana was trying and trying and trying to teach us. Hmm? But this is a very important subject. The secularized time. They broke it up mechanically into mechanical bits and pieces. Time. They took it and they couldn't break it into other than twelve months in a year. They had to stay with that. But then they took it and they broke it into 24 hours in a day. Why not 25, right? Why 24? And then they broke it into 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. And uh, we followed them. 
into the lizard's home. The transformation of time into something that was mechanical. It was the secularization of time. But Mulan Ansari warned us that time is sacred. And he used the hadith, which is the hadith of Qudsi. Hadith of Qudsi meaning that it is the direct speech of Allah, but not in the Quran. Hadith of Qudsi. So it is in a hadith, but it is a direct speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not assume that everybody here is a scholar. There are some here who may be just beginning to crawl. And they were fascinated by the international Islamic retreat and they've come here. So those who have more should reach out and share to those who have less. So we'll all go back home richer, and more learned, more educated. The hadith is, لا تسب الدحر فإني أنا الدحر إني أنا الدحر Do not disrespect time, do not abuse time. And secularizing time is precisely that. Because I, Allah, I am time. If Allah is time, and if Allah is the light of the heavens and of the earth, is that what he says? Allah nur as samawati wal Well then we have a fairly large subject ahead of us here, isn't it? Have we been directing any attention to the subject of time? In uh, Surah to Ali Imran, and I apologize, I've not memorized this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us again about methodology. About methodology. We have already had an introduction to methodology, which is usul tafsir methodology, uh, about not taking any ayah in isolation, okay? But rather getting the totality of the data, all the verses and all the ahadith, and then attempting to bring them together into an organic whole, a harmonious whole. In other words, the pearls have, this, have to be strung as a necklace. And you have to find that cord with which you can string them together as a necklace. What does Molana Ansari call that string or cord? Was it, can you remind me? System of meaning. Ah, very good, mashallah. The system of meaning. Hmm? And when you do that, then you can go to the ayah or to the hadith. <coughs> if you take it stand alone, you can be right, but you can also be wrong. You can say Ibris is an angel. And then we went on with methodology to warn that only the Quran is absolutely authentic. And so if there's even an appearance of a conflict, between what is plainly stated in the Qur'an and what is also plainly stated in the Hadith, then what do we do? Answer, we stay with the Qur'an until the, the contradiction or the appearance of a contradiction can be resolved, if ever. Hmm? We went on further with methodology. We have to teach the subject of methodology in bits and pieces because of the economy of time in this retreat. We went on further with methodology uh, to point to a very important verse in Surah Al-Baqarah to which we were introduced in the classroom in a very strange way. It caused, caused me to get red eh? and then I rushed to Dr. Ansari's office. Molana, this is what they told me in the classroom. That there used to be the verse here. It's no longer there. Abracadabra is gone. Sunday wrong. No verse of the Quran has been cancelled. 
No verse of the Quran has been forgotten or caused to be forgotten or abrogated. No. Naskh, cancellation, abrogation, refers to revelations which came before the Quran. If any verse of the Quran is cancelled or abrogated or caused to be forgotten, then he who was appointed as the sole teacher of the Quran, divinely appointed, it is his responsibility to tell us that this verse is cancelled. But there is no hadith in which he himself, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, has said that this verse is cancelled or abrogated. And now we see the awesome consequences of the mistake which has been made by so many. The one about alcohol and the 12 Russians is the less strategic disaster. Is that the 12 people died? Oh, you can't perform janazah over their bodies. But the one about riba is the most strategic disaster. Wait, Egypt, just wait and see what's going to happen. Hmm? Because you cannot resolve the problem of riba unless and until you follow the stage by stage process given in the Quran. So none of these stages have been cancelled or abrogated. Hmm? And then was it last night or this morning, I can't remember because they work it very hard. <laughs> Took me to a radio station last night. And you know what time we got back here? I, I have to compliment Muhammad, he didn't fall asleep while driving. <laughs> Midnight. <laughs> Midnight. Um, about the Qur'an cannot be understood sometimes unless you step out of the Qur'an, step out of the Hadith. Hmm? And we gave the existence, this, this, the, the explanation of one word in the Qur'an beginning with B. Bakka. Why has the word Bakka been used instead of Makkah? Nothing happens by accident. Hmm? And so we had a further lesson in methodology that sometimes to understand the Quran you've got to go outside of the Quran, go in history. Not only history in the past but present history as well. Hmm? Methodology goes one step further now where in Surah to Al Imran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah has sent down the book on you. Minhu amongst the verses of the book. Minhu ayatun muhkamatun. They are those verses which are plain and clear. The meaning of the verses are plain and clear. Hunna ummul kitab. These verses constitute the Ummul Kitab, the heart of the book. And praise be to Allah for the ulama and the mufassirun who devote their lives to explaining and teaching the Ummul Kitab. Without them, the whole structure will fall down. These are very, very important. Hunna Ummul Kitab. Wa mutashabihat. But there are other verses which are not muhkamat. <coughs> and these verses are described with the word mutashabihat. Hunna wa ukhar mutashabihat. Fa'amma alladheena fi kulubihim zayl. But those in whose heart there is crookedness. Eh? Zayl. Crookedness. 
فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهُ They are devoted to these verses and attempting to interpret these verses. اِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ in the process of attempting to interpret these verses, not explain it, interpret, they are on the road of fitna, of creating tests and trials and corruption, confusion. Wama ya'allamu ta'weelahu وَمَا يَعَلَّمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And then a comma. The, the punctuation did not come from above. We put the, we put the punctuation in. إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَكُولُونَ مَا يَكُولُونَ آمَنَّ بِهِ كل من عند ربنا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب. and those who are firmly grounded in this knowledge and and Allah Subhanahu wa two things here. No one understands the interpretation of the second set of verses but Allah. And then there's a comma. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they say, Kullu min indi Rabbina. All of it is from our Allah. And none can be admonished, none can penetrate, none can understand this, except those who are people of reflection. Ulul al The implication being that there are verses of the Qur'an, which even Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, who was sent to teach the book, could not understand. Does it make sense? And he is the all-wise God. Seems as though that karma is in the wrong place. Because this is contradictory. <coughs> Our teacher, blessed memory, Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, said, No, that karma is in the wrong place. This is not what the verse is saying. It is Allah knows the meaning, yes, but in addition to Allah, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, not just the superficial, the one with super, superficial acquaintance with knowledge, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they also know the meaning of the mutashabihat. The, the definition of mutashabihat now would be verses which have to be interpreted. I don't think anyone is going to challenge that translation or explanation. Muhkamat do not have to be interpreted because the meaning is plain and clear. But mutashabihat is subject to ta'wil, which is interpretation. <clears throat> and if they are to be interpreted, it will have to be by those who are firmly grounded in knowledge. So you've got to do your homework before you can attempt to interpret these verses. And there is a methodology of interpretation, and that is the totality of the data is from Allah. And since the totality of the data is from Allah, we have to take the totality if we want to understand the meaning of the singular. Hmm? You have to study the whole. And you also have to study what the Prophet said in explaining what is in the Quran. And after you have sat down with the totality of the data, trying to bring it together into a meaningful, harmonious, organic whole, 
then you might be able to discover the thread which binds it together. But as every scientist would tell you, every eminent scientist would tell you, that the great discoveries of science came after they had done their homework. They had burnt the midnight oil. And then one Sunday morning, perhaps sitting underneath an apple tree, like a flash, the answer came. An intuitive grasp. And Newton understood gravity. You know the story. An intuitive grasp and electricity was discovered. <laughs> that intuitive grasp is the introduction of Noor. In other words, spiritual insight. And Allah blesses you. So with an entirely rational inquiry, which must be conducted, you are still in need of a, 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 another component, namely internal, intuitive, spiritual insight. But then Allah speaks in Surah Al-Isra, and uh, Sheikh Ali Mustafa and myself have been pondering over this verse for some time now. You know the verse about every town and every city is going to be destroyed, including Cape Town. وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ الْمُخْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْكِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُوهَا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا وَكَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَسْتُورًا مَسْتُورًا So there are verses of the Qur'an which are covered. Mastur. Covered. When Allah chooses to raise the cover, only then those who are doing the homework and attempting to take the whole and locating the thread which binds it, then will we understand that the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah is actually saying, Ya ayyuhu ladhina amanu, la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wal-nasara awliya, ba'duhu awliya wa ba'du. O you who have faith in Allah, do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies in an alliance, whether it be NATO, or CENTO, or TOPITO, <laughs> do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. And if you do that, you belong to them, not to us. If you have a better translation of the verse, let me know it. Hmm? We never understood the verse this way. Never. Until the Kaaba was lifted. That the Qariya is Jerusalem. Hmm? How does it begin the ayah? Masam? Wa haramun. Ala qariyatin. Remember, this is the only ayah of the Quran you read word by word. Particularly the Arabs. When they hear it as though they're hearing it for the first time. Because it's always recited so it's a speed. Wa haramun ala qariyatin ahlaknaha. أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِرُونَ Which Qariya? Every single tafsir of the Qur'an to which you go gives different answers but none has given Jerusalem. And yet today, there is a growing recognition 
every day it's expanding, that it is indeed Jerusalem. But you could only come to the conclusion that it is Jerusalem with that methodology of the totality of the data. And so now we recognize the necessity of internal intuitive spiritual insight as an essential component in the study of the Quran. Now some companions of the Prophet ﷺ were traveling and evening time came and the Arabs are famed because they are from the seed of Ibrahim ﷺ. They are famed for their hospitality. I don't have the time that Sherman is going to pull up my socks but I could tell you some stories about Arab hospitality. It was evening time when they came across a tribe which was still worshipping the idols. And these people didn't like the new religion. So they didn't offer any hospitality to the Muslims. Okay, so we settled down for the night. In the middle of the night they came knocking at our door, maybe tent. Brothers, brothers, wake up. The chief of our tribe has been bitten by a snake. And we don't have any medicine. If we don't treat him, he'll be dead by morning. This new religion of yours, do you have anything to help us out? We said, well, since you offered no hospitality, you're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> so they asked how much. We said a hundred sheep. They said deal. One of the Muslims then went and he recited Surah al fatiha and blew on the chief and he was cured. I have to be soft now because there are some Jamaas who don't like to hear this. <laughs> he blew on the chief and he was cured. So we collected the hundred sheep we went back to Medina. And then we went to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and said, O Messenger of Allah, this is what happened. Can we keep the sheep? So he said, Well, people who are rewarded for less than what you did, keep the sheep, of course, keep it. But how did you know that there is ru'ya? And this in this context, ru'ya would be spiritual healing. In Surah al fatiha how did you know that? And then he went on to say that in Surah al fatiha there's a cure for every illness. So now it's time for us to scratch our heads and begin to think. Eh? It's a good thing to think. In Surah Al-Fatiha there is a cure for every illness. But only he is a Shafi, only he cures Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the implication is that the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha must reach him. And if it reaches him, then every illness can be cured. Well then, how does it reach him? Answer. It must reach the arch. Huh? And we know we know many things about the arch. For example, We know that his arch is resting on water. Or is on water. So the recitation of Surah Al Fatiha has to reach the arch. <laughs> and if it does, it can cure any, any, any illness. Like Imran's forgetfulness, my wife is always complaining. You tell him something, he didn't register on him. He's thinking about the next book he has to write. <laughs> so, how can it reach to the arsh? Well, then let's look at Surah Al Fatiha to find the answer. Uh, is there any doubt that the Quran, the first verse of the Quran is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Anybody challenge that? 
No, good. <laughs> and the, the first surah of the Quran is Surah Al Fatiha. Anyone challenge that? Good, mashallah, we have a good class here. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, the, the first ayah or the first verse of Surah Al Baqarah, Surah Al Fatiha, is Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Good, no problem. See how easy it is, Sheikh Ali Basa? So, Surah Al Fatiha is comprised of seven verses. And the first verse, how do we know it's seven? Because Allah speaks about Sab'an min al Matani. Huh? Seven often of, of repeated verses. This is Surah Al Fatiha. So we know it's seven. And we know that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is verse number one. So then we can go on now to the other six. If there are seven verses, in Surah Al-Fatiha. And they are identified as seven. And it is seven which is constantly repeated. Then I better pay attention to this seven, eh? So this is what we did now. We went and did our homework. We went into the Quran. And we found that Allah, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the material universe, the up. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبْعَ السَّمَاوَاتِ Oh my gosh, we are making progress now. He created, after having created the material universe, he directed attention to the skies and he then fashioned them into seven samawat. So now between here and there, the arch, there are seven samawat. What is the English translation or the French? We have French speaking people here of Samawat, where there's a lazy translation, which is heavens. That's a lazy translation. But Samawat is not heaven, it's Jannah. So then what is the translation of Sama? My teacher, blessed memory, Balana Fadl Rahman Ansari, who is not lazy in his use of language. So he described as Sama as a stratum. Oh, we never heard that word, such a difficult word. And then plural of stratum we are told is stratum. And a stratum is a world of space and time. You could imagine how our 21 year old eyes open big when we heard of these things. There are seven samawat and therefore seven worlds of space and time. Between here and the Absh. And if the recitation of Surah Al Fatiha, which is incidentally seven verses, so it looks as though each verse is linked to Isama. <laughs> so that if the recitation can climb, or to use a better word, ascend, okay, Sama by Sama, Sama by Sama, which means that the one who is reciting, Unfortunately, I can't do it all the time. Sometimes I do it. I feel sad about it. If the consciousness when you're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, the consciousness is that each ayah that I recite, and notice that Sheikh Ali Mustafa never joins two ayah together when he's reciting it. Eh? He recites Surah Al-Fatiha, one ayah at a time. Watch it. When you recite Surah Al-Fatiha and you have the consciousness as you recite the ayat, that as you recite the first ayah, you have the consciousness of having reached the first sama. And then the second and then the third and the fourth, it's called the psychology of religion. Then by the time you reach a mean, you would be psychologically at the Absh. 
And now you're going to recite the Quran and Allah is listening to you. And you are at the arsh reciting. So it's kind of difficult now because you're shaking a little bit. Huh? This traversing of the different worlds of space and time, every time you perform salah, is the necessary introduction to the subject of the dimensions of space and time. It's not an academic discipline to be studied at leisure when you have time to devote to it. It is a subject that confronts you every time you stand for prayer and you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. I'm sorry I had to take so much time to bring you here. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam in the Mi'raj travels the seven Samawat and reached to that point beyond which Jibra'il al-Islam could not go. Hmm? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam then returned And we were told that the spot on which he was sitting or lying was still warm. And so it was possible to travel all those worlds of space and time and come back in a journey which was essentially timeless because no time was spent. <clears throat> how, did he, how did he make this journey? Is it the physical body that went? Or, or did the physical body remain lying on the ground and another body go? Do we have any other body other than the physical body? I told you about the companion who pulled himself away from his wife. Did I tell you about it? And rushed to the battlefield? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. No? Yes, yes. No? No, no, no. Explain it. Somewhere else. Oh, yeah. 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 All right, okay, okay. A companion of the Prophet of Islam, Islam married Hanzala just before the Battle of Ohad and was given permission to spend the night with his wife. And they consummated the marriage during the night and he made his ghusl because if you don't make your ghusl, you will be Juno, in the state of Janaba. So he made his ghusl and then got ready to leave, to perform his Salatul Fajr and then leave for the battlefield. His wife held on to him. Which wife would not? It's just one night of marriage. His wife held on to him and he was forced to have sexual relations with her. And he then rushed to the battlefield without taking the bath, Kosovo. He plunged into the battle and was killed. The companion saw the Prophet ﷺ looking into the sky and saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. They looked into the sky, of course, very quickly because battle is going on. And they didn't see anything. And you don't have any time at that time to ask him a messenger of Allah, what's going on here? So when the battle was over, then they asked him, O messenger of Allah, what was it in the sky? We saw nothing. He said, that brother of yours who got married yesterday and who came this morning and plunged into the battle and was killed, I saw the angels giving him a in order for the Prophet ﷺ to say that, he had to be able to recognize the face of the person, the body of the person. So there was a body with a face over there in the sky. But there's also another one on the ground. Yeah. And both had the same features. When they returned to Medina, then they got the information and the riddle was solved that he was in the state of Janaba 
when he was killed. This story or this event informs us about the spiritual body. There is a spiritual body. In the Isra and Miraj, we now have an understanding of the process of creation. That Allah first creates the spiritual body. And it is the spiritual body without a material form. So that in Jannah, when they were asked to live in Jannah, they didn't need any toilets. No. Uskulanta was al Jannah. You and your wife go and live in heaven. They didn't need any toilets. Because although it was a body, it was not as yet a biological body, subject to biological laws. But then came the process of transformation when the physical body then took on a crust, okay, and emerged in biological form. If it can move in this direction, from spiritual to material, then it can be reversed. The movement can be reversed. And the movement was reversed in the Isra Miraj. So there was no physical body on the ground. No. The Prophet went. Nothing was stayed. Nothing stayed on the ground. But, says Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, his physical body was transformed into its transcendental form. That is his language. And it is in this transcendental form that he traversed the Samawat. But notice, and he gave us a description of all the things that he saw while traveling in the Samawat. But notice there were two events that occurred in the Isra Miraj, which did not happen by accident. First of all, there was a caravan which was camped for the night. And Burak came down on earth. And Nabi Muhammad got off Burak. And there was a container with water. And there was a lid on the container. He removed the lid. He drank the water. And then he replaced the lid down did not happen by accident. That happened to teach a lesson. And it was not confined to providing proof to the Quraysh that this actually happened because the caravan did eventually come to Mecca. And they questioned the caravan. And they said, yes, we went to sleep at night. And there was a container with water. And the lid was on the container. And when we woke up in the morning, the water had disappeared. And the lid was still there. But this was not meant only to convince the Quraysh about the truth of what he was saying. This was also meant to help us understand the subject of Tajjal. Because Nabi Muhammad while traveling in another dimension of space and time, came back to this world of space and time and drank the water and then returned to that world of space and time. So movement between two dimensions of world of space and time from the unseen to this world is possible. And then he stopped for a second time. Burak. And this time a caravan had camped for the night and one camel had broken loose. And he called out to the people, wake up, your camel had broken loose. And then they woke up and they found that the camel had broken loose and they searched and they found it. And when they returned to, to Mecca, they confirmed that this, has indeed, this did indeed happen, confirming the truth of what he had said. But again, this is meant to convey to us a message 
that it is possible to travel to different dimensions of space and time. Hmm? Now comes the difficult part of the subject. Nabi Muhammad said, But when the Dajjal is released, he'll live on earth for 40 days. And the, the, the number 40 is often used symbolically. For example, someone asked, for Messenger of Allah, which was the first masjid which was built? He said, Masjid Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem. Sorry, no, Masjid the Kaaba, Makkah. For Messenger of Allah, which is the second masjid which was built? He said, Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. O Messenger of Allah, how many years passed between the construction of all? He said, 40 years. If we understand the word 40 here, in the normal sense of the word, then this statement is manifestly wrong because thousands of years intervene between the two. So in the answer 40 years, he's conveying a message that language numbers can be used symbolically. Hmm? So when the Jal is released, he will live on earth for how many days? 40 days. Yawmun kasana, a day which will be like a year. Yawmun kashahar, a day which would be like a month. Yawmun ka a day which would be like a week. Wasairu ayyamihi ka ayyamikum and all his days, which may mean all the rest of his days, like your days. So now don't make the mistake of subtracting three from thirty-seven, which most people do. Hmm? And say that when he now appears in the world which is like in a day which is like our day, he's gonna live for thirty-seven days. Yeah, you could read that on the internet. No, don't make that mistake. We now are able to understand that the Dajjal is going to traverse three different worlds of space and time before he emerges in our world of space and time, and yet he would be on earth. How is it possible? Can we be on earth and yet be traversing different worlds of space and time? Is it possible? Well, the normal answer that you, you, the normal question will be asked to you, are there angels here on earth? Hmm? And the answer is yes, there are angels here on earth. But can we see them? No, we can. Are there jinn here on earth? And normally I say there are lots of them in Washington, you know. <laughs> How many? Are there jinn here on earth? Yes, there are. Can we see them? No, we can't. So the jinn and the angels are here on earth. And yet they are not in our world of space and time. And so it is possible for us to understand that the Dajjal can be on earth, yes, and yet he is not in our world of space and time. Can an angel take human form? Yes. Every married man says that. <laughs> can an angel take human form? The angel came in the masjid in human form and asked the five questions. Can a jinn take human form? Yes. yes, he came, the old man with the walking stick. And so the jar can eventually take human form because it is possible. Surah to Kaf of the Quran now comes to teach us. And when this is finished, then Surah Al-Baqarah takes over and tells us even more. The young men were in the cave 
and Allah put them to sleep for 300 years. لِنَعَلَّمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا This is the purpose. This is why I put them to sleep, to teach the subject of time. I am doing this so that you would study and understand the subject of time. So now ponder and reflect. If they are in the cave for 300 years, okay, then when I wake them up, one would expect if they were in biological time, their fingernails would be from as long as from here to the bay in Simon's town. Okay? And their beards would be as long as from here to Cape Town. But then when I woke them up and they questioned each other, one of them said, a day or a part of a day, which is very plain and clear that they had not aged biologically over 300 years. If they had not aged biologically over 300 years, the implication is they were not in our world of space and time. Hmm? They were in another world of space and time where you do not age. An old woman in Medina took the Shahada became a Muslim and had some doubts. O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm an old woman. Can an old woman enter heaven? He said, no. She's scared now. Why, O oh, Messenger of Allah, there are no old women in heaven. So he's capable of some fun. Eh? <laughs> He's capable of some fun, the messenger of Allah. I wish our ulama would learn from that. <laughs> Get your audience to smile sometime. Oh, messenger of Allah, now she's close to tears. And then he responds with the sweetest of smiles, which is the one you must save. When a woman puts out her hand to shake hands with you, Save that sweet smile. Because when you refuse to shake hands with her, my gosh, you could hear the thunder in the heavens above. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have to say to her, in Islam, we don't shake hands. But we offer a sweet smile. And then she'll smile and matter with all. <laughs> He smiled at her and he said, Allah will cause you to become a young girl once again. So in heaven, in that world, you don't need cosmetics. The cosmetic industry will shut down. <laughs> <laughs> you don't grow old. <coughs> so the young men did not, did not pass the 300 years in our world of space and time. They were not in biological time, what Dr. Ansari calls biological time. They were in another world of space and time where you do not age biologically. This is plain and clear. But Surah Tulkaf continues with the story to teach us more. But you have to, Ulul Al-Bab, you've got to ponder and reflect. Wait a minute, Imran. How can you say they were in another world of space and time? Did Allah not say that وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ كَذَا وَرُوا عَنْ كَحْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِدُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَاءِ وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَاءِ The bodies of the young men were rolling to the right and to the left, attracted by sunlight in the morning on this side and sunlight in the evening on that side. Well, this is this world. This world of space, because right of the cave and left of the cave, and this world of time, because morning and evening. So the bodies of the young men were in that cave, in our world of space and time, every single day for 300 years. 
And yet they were not in our world of space and time because they did not grow old. Would you find this analysis in Tafsil? No, you've got to ponder and reflect over it. And so now we know that there was continuous movement back and forth. Back and forth. That they were also in this world of space and time while they were in another world of space and time. And so Surah al kaf is teaching us about different dimensions of space and time, some different samawat, and the possibility of movement back and forth between the two. And now we leave Surah al kaf and we go to Surah al Baqarah. And the traveler is passing by the town which is lying in ruins, which town? Of course, Jerusalem. And he says, I don't see how it is possible for this to ever be raised again. And then Allah calls him to die for how long? A hundred years. A hundred years. And then Allah raised him back to life and asked him, how long have you been here? And he also said a day or a part of a day. And we also, having spent a thousand years in the grave and we are raised, we'd say maybe a day or a part of a day. And Allah says, no, you've been here for a hundred years. Now look at your food. I don't know if it was biryani. Look at your food. Lam yatasanna. The food is still fresh, even though a, thousand, a hundred years have passed. In other words, the food has survived these one hundred years in another world of space and time, which was not biological, in which women remain forever young, hmm? among men as well. But now look at your donkey. The donkey starved to death. The donkey's flesh rotted. The bones turned to dust. And then Allah revived the donkey. But the donkey and the food were in the same place. Despite <coughs> being in the same place, the food was in one dimension of space and time and the donkey was in another dimension of space and time, indicating that different dimensions of space and time can exist side by side. You don't have to take a taxi <laughs> to travel from one dimension of space and time to go to another. Hmm? They are existing alongside each other, side by side. And so now, what do we know about these worlds and space and time? We have very little information in the Quran and in the Ahadith, very little information. But we do have more information outside of the Quran and Hadith. In the Quran and Hadith we know there's a day with Allah which is like a thousand years. Like a thousand years. A day which is with Allah which is like 50,000 years. Hmm? That's in the Quran. Over here we have a day which is like 300 years. Over there we have a day which is like 100 years. It is when we go outside of the Quran and Hadith that we can get into trouble. Because Allah blesses some people with knowledge. And that knowledge comes to them through visions. Is there any part of prophethood still left in the world after the death of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam? No, he's dead, isn't he? He's the last prophet, isn't he? <coughs> isn't he? So prophethood is finished, isn't it? So how come you're telling me there's still a part of prophethood? Huh? Which is this part of Prophet we're talking about? Masabu? Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> true dreams and true visions. Ru'ya sadiqa 
and Rukia Salihna huh? to keep myself with company. Huh? Prophethood is comprised of 46 different parts. Everything of prophethood has ended with me, except one part which still remains in the world. That one part of prophethood which still remains in the world is true dreams and visions. True <coughs> dreams and visions. And so, yes, it is possible for you to have a true dream or vision informing you that Imam al Mahdi has been born. I don't deny that. And the information conveyed to you in that vision or dream can be true. I don't deny that. <coughs> However, there is no way that I can verify the validity of that knowledge. No, no way. And so, there is no compulsion on me for anyone to accept it. All right? So, uh, he is known as Sheikh Al Akbar. Like, another fellow was known as Shaitan Al Akbar. I won't mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Egypt. <laughs> and a taxi driver offered to take me to Sheikh Abdul Hamid Kishk. So I went and I met Sheikh Abdullah Hamid Kish, and he kept me waiting for half an hour in the sitting room. I said, this is not Arab hospitality. <laughs> After half an hour, Sheikh Abdullah Hamid Kish came and he offered his apologies. He said, I kept you waiting because I'm writing it a sale of the Quran. A blind man. And we sat down talking for half an hour. And he described Saddam Hussein as Shaitan al <laughs> <laughs> But history has conferred the title Sheikh al Akbar. On whom? On whom? Sheikh Muhyuddin Abdul Qadir. No, no. Sheikh Muhyuddin Ibn Arabi. Sheikh Muhyuddin ibn Arabi. He's known as, as Sheikh al Akbar precisely because he was blessed with so much knowledge through the medium of visions, not the traditional method that it comes in the book and it comes in the ahadith. Hmm? And he gave us a lot of information about the Samawat. We do not say that it is false. It's wrong to do that. <coughs> it could be true. It could be false. All right? But he gave a lot of information, and it's recorded in two of his books, which, is, which are so difficult to read that I need a bottle of Tylenol tablets. <laughs> One is called Fusus al Hikam, and the other Futuhat al Makkiyah. We are, other than Sheikh Al Akbar, Sheikh Al Akbar Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, there are many others who have <laughs> written and spoken about the Samawat because of knowledge that they have acquired through visions. Hmm? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, did point to the fact that it is possible for us to penetrate the Samawat. He did it, didn't he? He said. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> he said, as salatu mi'raj al-mu'min. He did it, didn't he? Come on, shake your heads. <laughs> as salatu mi'raj al-mu'min. That it is possible for the mu'min to experience his own mi'raj in salat or through salat. Hmm? So it is possible to traverse different worlds of space and time, to have the experience of different worlds of space and time, 
and to come back and to transmit knowledge about different worlds of space and time. But let me repeat it. Such knowledge cannot be objectively verified and validated. It could be the shaitan who took you for a ride, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you come back and believe, this is what happened to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Yeah. You believe that Allah is taking you and shaitan is taking you for a ride. Since this knowledge cannot be objectively verified and validated, I choose to be silent. I will not use that material. Someone else could use it, but I will not use it. So I confine my analysis of the Samawat, the different worlds of space and time, to what is located in the Qur'an and what is located in the Ahadith. Dajjal, when he's released, is on earth, but not in our world of space and time. Dajjal traverses the first stage of a day like a year, and we see him and recognize him by his footprints, Pax Britannica. And then he traverses the second stage of a day like a month. We can't see him. He is on earth. But we recognize him by his footprints, namely Pax Americana. And then he traverses his third stage, which is the last one, of a day like a week. And we are going to soon see his footprints, by which we recognize him, namely Pax Judaica before Dajjal will himself <coughs> appear in human form in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem, and ruling the world from Jerusalem, and then declaring, I am the Messiah. I believe this is the, I believe this is the correct explanation of the Hadith concerning a day like a year, a day like a month, a day like a week. And it was possible for us to offer this explanation because of our understanding of the different dimensions of space and time. Before I end, my book, Surah al of the Modern Age, has a chapter entitled, The Quran and Time. It is that chapter in which I have attempted to explain this subject. Rabbana taqabal minna inna kentis amil alim wa ta'ala 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 inna kentis am